Hello and welcome to Digital Science Saturday, Bats, Spiders, and Snakes, oh my. My name is Jacqueline Schneider and I'm the Community Science Outreach Coordinator for the Pacific Grove Museum of Natural History. Um, this morning at 10 a.m., a bunch of different videos went out uh, exploring different bats, spiders, and now we'll be getting an up-close look at snakes. So with me today, I have a Slithering Science, um, a local education um, organization that focuses on teaching people about snakes. Um, just a little reminder, feel free to put any questions in the chat and we'll be getting, the, getting to them as they come up. So Erin, do you want to take it away? Yeah, sounds good. I'm going to share my screen here. Okay. Is the screen sharing? Good. Okay, perfect. So I just wanted to quickly say like who I am, even though Jacqueline kind of already covered it. I am the owner of Slithering Science, which is a local to the Monterey Bay area here, reptile education kind of program. Uh, today we're going to be mostly focusing on snakes. I have a uh, master's in marine biology actually and a bachelor's degree in biology that focused a lot on herpetology because I was in the desert at the time. But my focus has definitely shifted away from marine biology and to reptiles, basically because my eldest daughter got very interested in reptiles and it kind of really sparked that passion for myself. So as kind of part of a homeschool project, we started up this education service and it's kind of just gone from there. And today I'm going to have two assistants. I'm going to have them come on camera here in just a second when I stop screen sharing. But it's my eldest daughter, Chloe. And I have a volunteer intern whose name is Paige, and I will have them come say hi in just a second. So today we're going to talk about snakes. Obviously snakes are reptiles, just like lizards, turtles, tortoises, and crocodilians, which are crocodiles and alligators. There's also another group of reptiles called the tuataras that most people have never really heard about. They're very lizard-like, but they're actually a different group. Obviously today we're here though to talk about snakes, my favorite group of reptiles. So with each snake that we talk about, we're gonna talk about a trait that separates snakes from all the other reptiles out there. Before we jump into talking about snakes though, we need to talk about a topic that's pretty important in the reptile world that a lot of people kind of mix up and that's the difference between poisonous and venomous. It's kind of one of my biggest pet peeves, so I kind of always throw this slide on first. What poison is, is poison is ingested. You eat it, you take it into your body. So for example, in this picture, the guy here has taken a bite out of this poisonous frog and has fallen ill from it. Whereas if something is venomous, the toxin is actually injected into the body, in this case through a bite wound through the uh, rattlesnake's fangs here. So the rattlesnake bit the person and then he fell in. So again, poison is ingested or eaten or taken into the body and venom is injected directly into the body. So let's talk about our first snake trait. It's the most obvious. Snakes are legless. Most other reptiles, with a very few exceptions, have legs. However, no snakes have legs. As you can see from all these pictures here, they are all completely legless. So our first snake we're gonna talk about is probably my most Halloween snake since it is Halloween. And that is Jack here. Jack is a Honduran milk snake. These guys are one of the longest milk snakes. You can reach about five feet long. They're found in Honduras, Nicaragua, and Costa Rica. And Jack here is what's called a tangerine morph. He, instead of the normal wild type, like this where it has these white bands right here. Jack actually has orange bands which makes him just the perfect snake for today for Halloween because he's exclusively black and orange and he's amazing. So the normal type is found in the same habitat as the venomous coral snake. Melt snakes however are not venomous at all but this mimicry helps them avoid predators. So Predators learn to avoid coral snakes because they 
are obviously very venomous. So if a predator learns to avoid a coral snake, they will also learn to avoid milk snakes because they look very similar. This is called mimicry and it helps the milk snakes. So let's talk about, let's meet Jack. Let me stop my share here and bring out Jack. Actually, let me say hi to uh, my assistants here really fast. This is Paige and, and this is Chloe. They're going to be handing me all the snakes today and taking them back so I don't have to go back and forth. Good job, guys. Thank you. So this is Jack. He is still a baby. As you can see, he's nowhere near five feet long right now. And look at those gorgeous Halloween colors on him. And I got Jack actually from a college student who was going back to school and he thought he would be able to take Jack with him, but unfortunately the school didn't allow pets and especially didn't allow snakes. So I got him from him. Snakes make amazing pets, but it's a very long-term commitment. Snakes can live about 20 years or more. And so, I mean, just think of all the things that can change in 20 years. My, my kids have snakes of their own, but we've talked about before they got them, all the things that could happen in those 20 years. Things like getting married, moving, getting different jobs, going to school, going to college. But Scout yeah, said, they're amazing pets if you can do the commitment. So, oh, so I scared him there for a second. So obviously Jack got his name from looking like a jack-o'-lantern. So he is forever my Halloween snake, not even just on Halloween. And it's kind of interesting when you think about it, why these guys are called milk snakes. Snakes really don't have anything to do with milk. They don't produce milk, they don't drink milk. But when these guys were first being described, farmers would find them a lot of the times in their barns. And they actually thought that the milk snakes were stealing the milk directly from the cows. They thought these snakes were just latching on and <laughs> stealing the milk. What they didn't think about at the time was that what else is found in barns? Lots of mice and rats and rodents. So these snakes were there and they were trying to eat all the rodents and actually helping the farmers out by kind of keeping their rodent population under control. But since they thought they were stealing the milk, unfortunately back then a lot of milk snakes were killed and then the rodent population obviously exploded as well. So yeah, Jack is, honestly Jack's a sweetheart. I absolutely love him. And then he is, yeah, does anybody have any questions here about Jack? If not, we're gonna put him back and move on to our next one here. Okay, you guys take Jack back. Okay. So our next snake trait is that snakes have overlapping scales all over their bodies and the scales on their bellies are long and rectangular. Now all reptiles have scales, but the scales on snakes are a little bit different. There's kind of different, there's two main types of body scales. Some have these keeled scales, which if you look at this picture, you can see this ridge down the center of each scale and you can see how all these body scales overlap. That ridge down the scale actually gives these snakes a very rough, feel they feel it's hard to describe it's, this is one of the downfalls for these virtual presentations is usually you'd be able to feel these snakes and actually touch them and feel the differences and feel the snake in your hands but if we contrast those keeled scales to the main other type of body scale which are smooth you can see that these are very shiny these snakes have a very sh like shiny appearance and then if we look at belly scales you can see that they're very rectangular. This is one of my baby bull snakes. I just got her a couple months ago and she loves climbing under the background. That's the background of her tank and hanging out in this little tiny cutout in the background. The first time I saw her do that, I thought she was stuck and I freaked out, but then she just kind of turned herself around and got right out there and that's her favorite place to hang out right now. But you can see the rectangular scales there on her belly and if we look at the next picture, you can see both the rectangular scales on the belly and the overlapping scales. These scales kind of help the snake in multiple different ways. 
The first way is that it obviously protects the snake as they're moving through the environment. And it also helps snakes retain moisture. A lot of snakes are found in environments that are pretty dry, like deserts and things like that, where they might not have access to a lot of water. And they, <clears throat> the scales act to keep all their moisture inside instead of just evaporating out. And these belly scales, they're rectangular for a reason. They are, each edge can kind of grip onto the ground or grip onto a tree and kind of help the snake move along or help the case in this one snake to climb this tree. Even if the snakes have keeled scales, they're still gonna always have smooth belly scales. You can't imagine running this rough belly scales across the ground. That's not gonna be very effective in moving. So then we are going to look at my, well, I nicknamed them my candy corn snakes. Again, also very Halloween snake. These are the Nelson's Melt Snake. I have three of them right now. This one in here has decided to go as a milkshake for Halloween this year. That's her Halloween costume. She is actually named Milkshake. She's Milkshake the Milk Snake, which is, <laughs> takes some practice to say. She actually climbed in there 100% willingly. She thought it was a fun little cave and I absolutely loved it. She is an albino milk snake. And albino means it removes all of the dark brown or black pigmentation. So another name for this is actually amelanistic. And the normal type of the Nelson's milk snake looks like this. So you can see where all of that black pigmentation is. On the albino snake, it actually becomes this white and it also turns their eyes that reddish color. They are also a coral snake mimic. These guys are found in Mexico and Central America and they are also non-venomous. So we have Cheeto here. Cheeto is my little explorer. She cracks me up. Every time I put her back in her tank, that's what she does. She climbs around her bars. This picture was taken right when we got that tank above was a uh, Pac-Man frog I adopted that I hadn't got fully set up, but she decided to go check out the tank on her way back into her enclosure and she loves squeezing herself through those little bars and she's just she's hilarious she's an amazing snake so let me stop the share and you guys can meet cheeto and we had a question um how does jack get his color but i guess this can also go for all of the milk snakes you're talking about how do they get their color as far as that is their color relation is just the wild type is how they've just evolved the coral snakes have evolved those bright, bright colors to warn potential predators away from eating them, kind of like, don't eat me, like a big advertisement. And the milk snakes have evolved alongside that to kind of, again, have that mimicry that don't eat me either, I'm big, I'm scary too. And then for some of the albino and the, the coloration, like the tangerine phase, that's actually bred. They are picked specific animals and continue to breed them along that line to get that into the pet trade. And so you can see Cheeto here, she's looking really dull right now. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit later, but she is actually getting ready to shed. Unfortunately, she decided to do that today, of course. Then my other one, Milkshake, is also shedding. So they both look really dull today and don't have that candy corn coloration, unfortunately. But Cheeto is honestly my best program snake. I got her from a SPCA up north. And unfortunately, her previous owner passed away and her next of kin wasn't able to take care of her but she is the calmest snake ever. And just with her bright candy corn colors and her disposition and her curiosity, even people who are afraid of snakes will often come and they'll actually fold Cheeto, which is just amazing to see. I love that moment when somebody comes in terrified and then by the time the program's over, they're sitting there with Cheeto wrapped around their hand like this. It's just amazing. And Cheeto is the perfect snake for that. So, yeah, let's see if, I don't know if you can see on there, but her, even her red eyes look kind of gray. She's kind of, kind of in zombie mode actually right now because she's about to shed, kind of tying in the Halloween here. And then we had another question. Um, is it difficult to tell the, the sex of snakes? 
For some species, it's really easy. One of the ones we have coming up, I'm gonna show you the male and a female. They're vastly different sizes. And some of them will have different tails, like their tail will be thicker or the tail will be thinner or longer or shorter. But for the majority of them, you actually have to kind of probe them, which is putting a probe inside their cloaca to find out. A lot of mine, if I'm not have any intention to breed them, I have no honest idea. I just kind of pick one and roll with it. So for some reason, I've decided Cheeto's a girl. She may very well be a boy. <laughs> I honestly don't know. One of these days, I'll probably get around to actually probing them all. But since I'm not breeding them, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. But I don't know if it's coming through on the camera, but you can see her rectangular belly scales there. And if you can, it's hard to see through the camera, but if you were here feeling them, you could tell that they all kind of have this little ridge that they can grip onto things. And right now I can actually even feel them kind of gripping onto me, especially since she's shedding and that top layer of skin is a little bit looser. But she's so calm, she can just do that. And you can see her overlapping scales there as well. So should we say bye to Cheeto here? No, she's like wrapped around my arm. There we go. <laughs> go back to this. So our next snake trait, kind of like we actually just saw, saw there with Cheeto, is that snakes shed their skin in one piece. The shed you see here is from one of my baby bull snakes. And that was just an amazingly perfect shed. Most of them are like this, but I caught that one right away. And they're kind of still moist right after they shed it. And it allows you to kind of stretch it out really nice. After they dry, they kind of get a little brittle and they'll kind of fall apart somewhat. But young snakes will shed pretty frequently because they're still growing. So as they grow, they need to shed their skin. But as they get older, they'll still shed. It'll just become kind of less and less, potentially even down to maybe only once a year. And before they shed, like you saw with Cheeto, the inner layer of skin will secrete kind of an oily substance. And that kind of helps the outer layer start to separate away from the inner layer. And during that time, the snake looks kind of dull and the bright colors kind of fade. And because you're basically looking through the old layer and this oily layer. And they just kind of take on the zombie appearance, especially the non-albino snakes because they have a black eye. Their eye will actually go this brownish gray. And I couldn't, unfortunately, I don't have a good picture of that. I need to get one the next time I see one of my snakes in that shed mode because it, it's actually kind of creepy and very zombie-like. Um, so what they do when they're ready to shed is that they will actually rub their nose onto a rock or a branch or something hard and kind of break away that front part of their skin. And then they'll rub their bodies along something rough as well. And it kind of almost peels back the shed, almost like if you're taking a sock off and you grab it from the top and you just pull it all the way off. So it actually ends up inside out because the snake basically just crawls out of their old skin. So let's talk about the Plains Hognose. These snakes have the ultimate Halloween costume. They are named for their upturned nose. So these little guys have their Halloween costume is a pig. They are always in costume. They always look like these adorable little piggies. And they use that nose to dig up frogs and toads into burrow for themselves. They, <clears throat> sorry, they are pretty small snake. They're only around one and a half feet for males and females around two and a half feet. So that's one of those ones you can tell that if it's a male or a female once they reach adulthood. And they are found here in the US, kind of in the Midwest. Unfortunately, not out here. I would love it if they were here, but <laughs> they are more in the Midwest. And what's interesting about them is they are actually a venomous snake. A lot of people assume that venomous automatically means dangerous, but that is not the case at all. There are plenty of venomous animals that aren't dangerous at all. If we think about things like most spiders, although obviously there are a few spiders that are venomous and dangerous to people, but most spiders are venomous and not dangerous to people. Also things like 
ease that unless you're allergic to their venom, you're not going to have a medically significant reaction. So the plains hognose here is also a venomous animal. When you think of a venomous snake, you usually think about like a rattlesnake or a cobra with those big fangs up front and they're just like, you can just tell that they're out to get you or not out to get you, but they have that fear about them that people equate to a venomous snake. Hognoses are a little different. They don't have those front fangs. They're called rear fanged, which means they actually have teeth in the back of their mouth where venom throw, flows through a little groove. And they actually kind of have to chew the venom into their prey. It's not like a needle where they just inject it right in. And they have some pretty interesting defensive mechanism, mechanisms beyond just being slightly venomous. Their first one is that they flatten out. They look like this. You can see on the bottom here is the normal way they are. And the top is they just flatten out their heads and they try to look really big and scary. This, a lot of people think this is mimicking a cobra, but they aren't found in the same area. So there's no way they can be mimicking something they aren't around. They're just trying to look big and scary and intimidating. And another one is plain dead. These guys will flip over on their backs. They'll writhe around like they are dead and dying and they'll even poop all over themselves so they smell like death. And it's pretty in insane to watch these guys do this little acting show. Let me see if I can, unfortunately, my, not unfortunately, but my snakes are so habituated to people that they won't ever show this, but I have a video here of that. Is the video up? Okay. Yeah. And then we also had another question. Um, do snakes shed a layer of their skin off their eyes? They do, yeah. I'm actually going to talk about that. I think that might be our next snake trait, actually. But yeah, you can see this little guy right here. This is a baby. I think this guy said he was a newborn, like day old hognose snake, and he is fully committed to acting dead. He's flipped upside down, his tongue's lolling out. He even said he did poop on him. This guy, he's dead. Nothing wants to eat him when he's like that because there's obviously something wrong with him. <laughs> and that's how these guys will avoid predators when, especially when they're young, they'll do this, but even some older snakes will keep doing it. Oops, sorry about that, I got all the way out of it. So let's meet coffee. Okay, good. Some coffee. He's crazy. They said he's acting crazy. <laughs> this is coffee. He is a boy. He's pretty tiny. I'm hoping he shows up. Is he showing up pretty okay on the camera? Okay. Hopefully you can see his little tiny upturned nose there. He's pretty young still. He has a growing to do, but he's going to stay fairly small. And What's really cool about these guys in programs is letting people hold them and then they can go home and say, hey, I held a venomous snake today. And I mean, how many people can say that? And he's just so cute with his little nose. So in the wild, hog noses will usually eat toads and frogs, which if you know about toads and frogs, they're usually Poisonous. So now we're back to the poisonous because that's something they're going to go and eat. But somehow the scientists are still trying to figure out exactly why the hognoses are immune to that poison. So they can eat the frogs and the toads. And frogs and toads, when they're feeling threatened, a lot of the times they will puff up and make themselves bigger and potentially be too big for the hognose to take. So what these guys will do is they'll actually bite the hognose or bite the toad and essentially pop the toad <laughs> so that all the air is released and that they can still swallow the toad whole because snakes aren't able to chew so they have to swallow everything whole and that is one of the drawbacks to having them as a pet is a lot of the times they still want that food they want the toads and the frogs but you can eventually get them onto like frozen and thawed mice a lot of times you have to actually rub dead mice on 
onto a toad or a frog to kind of get the scent on it. So they're definitely not a snake for beginners, but they are an amazing snake. I love them. Let me just see the little cutie pie. You guys want to come grab coffee? Yeah. Say bye, coffee. Good job. So yeah, this is what the, what the question was about right here, was actually the shed skin over the eyes, and they do. Snakes' eyes are covered with a clear scale, and they don't have eyelids. Snakes have the, don't have the ability to blink at all, and their eyelids will shed right along with the rest, or not their eye, yeah, their eye caps, not their eyelids. Their eye caps will shed right along with the rest of the shed skin. It's all attached as one piece. This uh, clear part over the eye is sometimes called a spectacle, but it's basically just a modified scale that has been modified to be completely clear, which is part of the reason why when they are in shed, they will sometimes be a little, a little more sassy, let's say, in captivity because they can't see. And a lot of the times they We'll kind of stop eating and even though they rely more on the sense of smell and stuff like that not being able to see kind of they just want to kind of hunker down and wait for their shed to be done Let's see. and then these two pictures while we're talking about eyes you can see this top snake the eye has a very slit like a kind of cat-like slit pupil and the bottom snake has a very round pupil kind of like ours it used to be thought that that's a way to tell venomous from non-venomous snakes, but it's absolutely 100% not. And also how close would you get to a snake to be able to figure that out anyway? But what it means instead is that those with the slit are actually more of the nocturnal snakes, which means they're active during the night. And those with the round pupil are actually more of the diurnal snakes, which are active during the day. So let's... Very cool. And we have another question. Um, yeah. Are there any other snakes that have a similar structured face as the hognose and are able to dig in the dirt? Not similar to the hognose. There's definitely other snakes that can dig, but they there's a shovel nose snake that's kind of more of a pointed, flattened kind of digging apparatus, but nothing that has that kind of upturned pig-like snout. So let's see, let's talk about the gopher snake. These guys we do have here and I love them. They're one of my favorite snakes to see when I'm out hiking and stuff because I just, there's something about them that just looks very snake-like for lack of a better term and they just look very cool. They are also non-venomous. However, they are often mistaken for rattlesnakes, both by animals and people. It's good for the snake to be mistaken for a rattlesnake by animals because they will leave it alone. They won't try to eat it. It's really bad for the snake to be mistaken for a rattlesnake by people, though. A lot of people see a rattlesnake on their property or something and instantly think it needs to die. And unfortunately, that's bad enough for the rattlesnake, but it's even worse for the gopher snake who is just there to eat the rodents and are actually really good to have on your property. So if I'm gonna see if I can show these videos. They mimic the rattlesnake in a couple different ways. This first one here is, they will actually shake their tail in a way that mimics the rattlesnake. And of course they don't have a rattle, so it can't, it, it can't make any noise. However, they can, this is like not the right video. Hold on, sorry about that. Let me try to pull up the right video. There we go. So this is what the gopher snake will do. He'll shake his tail, he'll make this hissing noise with his mouth, and he'll curve up in this very, very rattlesnake-like position. And if you listen, you can hear the hissing. sound comes from her throat, her glottis. Sounds like a rattle. 
She's got fake teeth right here on the side of her face. You know she's not a rattlesnake because I would never put my finger that close to a rattlesnake. She's got a rattlesnake pattern. She has rattlesnake scales. Everything about her. She's a little mimic. So they will do that and look really similar to rattlesnakes to scare off potential predators. They are found pretty much from the Midwest all the way out here to California. The one, the different ones, some are called bull snakes and some are called gopher snakes, but they're all a type of gopher snake. And so now we are going to meet Jeff. Let's see. Jeff. This is Jeff. He is he is an adult. He's kind of small for a gopher snake though, a little small, just because I think in his previous house, I don't think he got the best care. He was actually, I got him from a rescue down south where unfortunately his first owners bought him as a captive bred baby and they decided they no longer wanted him and they were just going to release him. And that is a big, big no-no both for the individual snake itself and for the snakes in the wild. The snake itself, Jeff here, has never had to hunt for his own food. He gets his food put right in front of his face and has never had to escape a predator. As you can see, he is just super calm and would not survive in the wild on his own at all. And then on the flip side, if he were to survive in the wild, there's a possibility of him bringing diseases and anything like that that the wild population might not be immune to that these captive bred snakes could be immune to and they could spread really rapidly through the wild population so you never ever ever want to release a pet snake or any other pet for that matter into the wild jeff here is <clears throat> he is super calm as well a lot of people get intimidated to hold him though. I think it's because he looks like a rattlesnake, just he has that snake look. So it's pretty interesting to watch people care, hold Cheeto and love on Cheeto. And then if I'd say, hey, do you wanna hold Jeff? It's kind of like, uh, no. <laughs> when he is just as sweet and just as calm as Cheeto is. In fact, last year for Halloween, my family and I dressed up as a reptile zoo and we went trick-or-treating and I actually brought Jeff with us and he went for the entire time with us, just like this, was curled up on my hand the whole time and just let anybody and everybody pet him that wanted to pet him. And he just hung out all night long, just like this. And let's see if, I don't know if we can see his pupils, it's probably not gonna zoom in that well, but his pupils are round. So that means he is a diurnal snake. He is active during the day. And that's when he's out doing his hunting and finding mates and doing all that stuff. And he is a sweetheart. I actually saw a gopher snake rollerblading down the, uh, that bike path between Marina and uh, Sand City once. I was rolling down one of those big giant hills on some rollerblades with a friend. This was like a long time ago. <laughs> but, and it just kind of slithered across the pathway and my friend and I had to like jump over it here on our rollerblades. And so these guys are here. They are basically right in our backyard, even if you don't really ever see them because they blend in so well with the environment that they're in. Do you know? snakes like being pet like other pets do? <laughs> they don't, they tolerate it. And some of them seem to enjoy being out in the interaction, but they don't necessarily like being pet. And others don't like it at all. I have a handful of snakes that are 100% not programmed snakes. They never will be. They don't, they prefer to just be in their enclosure on their own, doing their life. But, but snakes like Jeff, I feel like Jeff, it's hard to kind of, you don't want to give them too much of a human personality, but I feel like he enjoys like just exploring to them it's not really about me he doesn't care about me at all but he just wants to explore and kind of see what's going on and he's a very he and Cheeto are very curious snakes they both just like to check things out and i think that makes a good 
a good handleable handleable snake when they just want to see what's going on. But yeah, so there's Jeff. He is probably my favorite snake, but don't tell the others. You guys want to take Jeff? <laughs> my daughter just said they can hear you. <laughs> So our next snake trait is that snakes do not have external ears or ear holes. You can look at all these pictures and look on the side of their heads there and you don't see any ears, like no external ears like we have and no ear holes. When you look at something like a lizard, however, you can see right here the little hole that's an ear. It isn't to mean that snakes don't have ears, they actually do have ears, but they're just internal and they're covered by the scales and by flesh and everything like that. They can hear, scientists are kind of debating back and forth on what they can hear and how well they can hear, but it's looking like they can only hear some sounds and some frequencies are better than others, especially the lower ones. So they can probably hear like me walk by because they pick up the sounds actually through their whole body and then kind of pass it to their ears. And so our next snake is my favorite, probably overall species of snake. And these are the egg eating snakes. So you guys know most snakes will eat mostly like rodents, mice, rats. They'll also eat birds and other reptiles. However, egg eating snakes eat exclusively bird eggs. They eat absolutely nothing else. They cannot eat anything solid. They can determine an egg's freshness by just smelling it. They'll go up to an egg, they'll smell it a few times and determine if it's fresh and also determine if there is a developing embryo inside. If there's a bird developing in there already, they can't eat it. And it's absolutely amazing that they can determine that by just smelling the egg. What they do is they actually will eat the egg and they will bring it down a couple inches into their neck, I guess you would call it. And then they have these bony projections on their spine that actually crack the egg after it's already swallowed it. Then they kind of do this shimmy and the shake and they pull all of the liquid parts of the egg out and they swallow that. And then they actually regurgitate or basically throw up the shell. And I have a video of that in a second. A lot of guys get really excited when I tell them that these snakes have absolutely no teeth. They cannot bite you. At most they could gum you but they cannot bite because they have no teeth. They have also some pretty cool defensive behaviors. The first one is rubbing their keeled scales. Remember keeled scales have that ridge down the side that makes them really, or down the middle, that makes them really rough. And they will kind of rub them together and make this kind of hissing kind of sound that sounds a lot like a saw scaled viper, which is a venomous snake found in the same area that they live in. Imagine if you're rubbing two pieces of sandpaper together, you're gonna get this kind of raspy, hissy kind of sound. And they also do bluff strikes. They're bluff strikes because they, again, can't bite you. They have no teeth. But they look pretty intimidating when they do it. This is one of my egg eaters. This is Cleo. I don't know if the sound's coming through. But you can see her doing this. This is her, this is her being very angry because I changed her water. I don't know if you, is the sound coming through of the, like, no, okay. No. But you can see her doing her bluff strikes there. And then, so this is, these are really bad videos because I, they don't like to be filmed eating, I've found. I'm trying to get better ones. But here on the side, you can see she's smelling the egg and trying to determine if it's fresh enough. That's a Caternix quail egg. And then she's determined to go for it, that it's a good fresh egg with no baby bird inside. So this little thin snake is going to swallow down this egg hole. I'll just let that play for a second. So you can see their skin gets so stretched out, you can see the markings on the egg through the skin there. 
and then she'll swallow it until it goes a couple inches back and then she'll crack the egg and then it takes a while but she'll eventually suck out all of and swallow all of the liquid contents and then she can't she can't digest the shell so she has to get rid of it and she'll do this little shimmy shape until the egg shell comes back up and that's what she's going to do right here And there it goes. And then you can kind of see your, a lot of people think snakes unhinge their jaws. They don't unhinge them, but they are very flexible. And they can, they do have to kind of like get everything kind of re, realigned, but it's not resetting. They aren't unhinged at all. So let's see. And uh, we have another question. Yeah. Um, is the scent of the growing embryo or something about the egg contents that the egg eating snake can identify? Um, they aren't sure. It's got to be the scent of the embryo itself because they, if you put one with an embryo right next to one without an embryo that's like a day old or unfertilized even, they'll go for the unfertilized egg or the one that has no development. But it's, I don't think anybody knows exactly how they're doing that because that's, I mean, that's pretty sophisticated to do through the eggshell and through everything else, especially to pick one egg that's right next to another egg and know which one it can eat and which one it can't, even within like a nest of eggs that all would have the same kind of external sort of smell. But this right here is Omelette. She is one of my female egg eating snakes. And these are one of the species I was talking about that's very easy to tell the difference between the females and the males. She's going for the camera. <laughs> She's a diva, I guess so. So this is the female and this is the wiggly male. He is much smaller and much thinner than her. He's only about the width of maybe like two pencils or less. And then she is pretty chunky in comparison. She has to be bigger to be able to hold her own eggs and to be able to lay those eggs. Whereas being small for him and only eating a liquid diet works pretty well to his advantage when he doesn't have to be big like her to hold eggs. And it's also as amazing as these guys will not eat reptile eggs, even if they're fertilized, unfertilized, they only do bird eggs, which it's good that they won't turn around and eat their own eggs after being laid, which is something a lot of people ask is how they don't do that because they know it's a different type of egg. And a reptile egg actually feels quite a bit different than a uh, bird egg. Reptile eggs are kind of a little bit rubbery, a little bit elasticy kind of, whereas bird eggs are obviously quite hard. You can see there. These guys look pretty comical actually, especially the males because their eyes are so big for the size of their head. They just look like these little cartoon snakes to me. Yeah, if you want to take the male back so I have a hand. <laughs> and then uh, we had a couple questions. Yeah. Um, one, do they have a favorite kind of egg? And then also, um, is there anything that you know that eats snake eggs? Um, there's a lot. A lot of lizards will go after snake eggs. And they will eat pretty much any bird egg that is the appropriate size. These guys right now are eating the quail eggs. I just buy them from uh, the Asian market, actually. And when they're babies, they are tiny as babies. I mean, you saw the full-size male. And these are tiny, tiny little babies. I actually, I am breeding these guys because I actually want to stop them from being imported as pets because right now a lot of them are imported. So I'm trying to increase the captive bred population. And as babies, they need like finch eggs or eggs that are that small. And a finch egg is only like that big. They are just tiny. And even that just stretches them out but they'll eat pretty much any eggs. A female like this, she's a pretty large female. She could actually probably handle a chicken egg. I haven't tried her on one yet just because she does so well with the quail eggs, but she could probably actually handle a chicken egg. Um, are these snakes found local, like in the wild here? 
Uh, Egg-eating snakes are not. These guys are found pretty much exclusively in Africa. This is another one I love to have people hold that are a little skittish and a little scared because again, they don't have the teeth and people feel pretty com comfortable with that, which, hey, I don't blame them. I'd rather hold something with no teeth. But <laughs> and these guys feel, <clears throat> they have the keeled scales to rub against each other and they just feel so different than the smooth scaled snakes. They kind of almost feel like a little bit of sandpaper in your hands. And you can just feel, they feel like muscular ropes. I think that's the only way I can kind of describe them. You can feel their muscles moving and contracting. And it's such an amazing feeling that I can't wait until COVID pandemic stuff is over so I can start sharing that again with people. But yeah, here, you want to take him back or her back? Okay, thank you. Okay. So let's review the snake traits we talked about really quick. Remember, they are legless. They have overlapping scales all over their body and their belly scales are long and rectangular. They shed their skin all in one piece. Their eyes are covered with clear scales and they don't have eyelids. And they do not have any external ears or ear holes. So the last animal I have today, I'm gonna to do a little differently. I'm going to show him to you first and then tell you what he is and talk about him. So these guys are Tom and Sal. For you Harry Potter fans out there, they are named after Tom Riddle and Salazar Slytherin because they look so much like the basilisk in that movie to me that they just had to be named that. So let me stop the share here. First diff thing you'll notice is my assistant's handing me Tom in his travel bin instead of taking him out because he is a little, little harder to handle. Even though he's gonna prove me wrong and be totally chill right now. But this is Tom. I want you guys to take a really close look at him and see if you notice anything about him that might be a little different than the animals we've looked at before. You can see he's, he's very long and he has no legs, but let's look at his face. I don't know if anybody can notice anything a little bit different about this guy. I'm kind of trying to trick you a little bit. Oh, yep, somebody got it. You can see he has, oh, he's gonna do it now. He's getting feisty. He has an ear hole. So as we learned before, he cannot be a snake, right? Because snakes don't have ear holes. This is actually a European legless lizard. Instead of being a snake, he's a lizard, even though he has no legs but you can see he just has a very more lizard-like face. He does have that ear hole right there. And this is how he tries to get away. He does a death roll kind of thing because he can't quite slither the same way as a snake through my hands. And you can also, I don't know if he's gonna do it right now because he doesn't blink too often, but he does blink. He has eyelids that can blink just like ours and you can close his eye. And his mouth is a little bit differently shaped. <laughs> he is doing his rolls. He actually can tear his food apart instead of a snake that has to eat it completely whole. And he, when he sheds, he kind of sheds in this weird sort of, sort of like a snake, sort of like a lizard. Lizards will usually shed bit by bit, whereas snakes will shed, obviously there is, like I said, at one time. He will shed his tail kind of like a snake and then bits and pieces of his body he's rolling again and he is sometimes a little hard to handle sal is sal is very hard to handle <laughs> so that's why i had them hand him to me in the box and another difference is that he can actually drop his tail if he feels threatened enough his tail starts right actually right here so this a whole entire part back here is all tail and that he decided to feel threatened enough he would drop that and then try to get away with the rest he's doing his little death rolls again so i'm going to put him back because he's getting a little crabby he for halloween tries to trick us all and be a snake 
And let's see. So Tom and Sal are legless lizards. They crack me up. They absolutely freak my husband out. He thinks they're evil just because they will sit there and stare at you like that. And he he hates them. <laughs> it's kind of funny, honestly. <laughs> They're also called glass lizards because of the way their tail breaks and they have so much tail. People thought they were just falling apart when they first saw these snakes. Um, another couple of questions. Um, how do snakes sleep if they don't have eyelids to close? And then also do lizards regrow their tails? They will sleep basically just with their eyes open. It's just, they do everything with their eyes open. And most lizards will regrow their tails. There are a few that don't. And even if they do regrow them, it's usually only one time they can do that. And it doesn't grow back quite the same. A lot of the times it's shorter or it's kind of like stubbier or it's thinner. It's never quite as good as the original. So they don't, they don't want to lose their tail. It's kind of a last resort sort of thing as a just a last ditch here eat my tail while I get away kind of thing <laughs> so yeah these guys aren't snakes because they have eyelids they have external ear openings the one thing I'm not sure if you could tell while he was rolling around is their scales are the same on their whole body they don't have the large rectangular belly scales they're just the same type of scales all around and they can lose their tail when threatened which snakes cannot do they can also rip their food apart and their jaws are a lot less flexible. They can't really extend their jaws open wide to make take in big prey items. So yeah, that's pretty much it for today. So yeah, if you are interested in this stuff and wanna learn more about these critters or other critters, just like my uh, Facebook page, learn more about them and some upcoming events. And thank you guys all for watching. Thank you guys. Uh, thank thank you. you. Yeah, and your assistance. I did want to give a shout out to a local legless lizard here mm -hmm. uh, because we got to see those really gigantic ones. <laughs> um, but here in California, we have the California legless lizard, which is actually an endangered species mm -hmm. uh, native to California, and they're protected. So they're really cool. Um, they're like this bright yellow color with a stripe going down their side. You can usually find them like in sandy or dune type habitats, um, but they're not a snake. They're a legless lizard and they're endangered. So they're super cool. Uh, other than that, I just want to say thank you so much, Erin and your assistants for taking time out of your day to show <laughs> off. They're, they're taking a bow. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that was fantastic. Um, loved learning about all the different types of reptiles you have and what makes snakes truly snakes. Awesome. Well, thank you guys for letting me come and do this. It was amazing. <laughs> We're looking forward to having you hopefully in the museum. Yes, in the that would be definitely. And uh, if anybody has any last minute questions or comments, uh, feel free to either unmute yourself and ask or type them into the chat. And just so you know, all of our Digital Science Saturday content is on our website. There's also links to um, Aaron's Slytherin Science Facebook page. And be sure to subscribe to the museum's YouTube channel. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Aaron.